Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode on the George Hubby podcast. Guys, I have a very special guest tonight, and you know, it has to kind of do with the not-so-secret opinion I have that there's there's a lot going on wrong with our generation today. There's a lot going on externally, internally, a lot wrong with our mindset and our lives. Here to focus more on the internal aspect of it, I invite my good friend, Harrison Mar. You got Harrison, it. Nailed it. I it's hope I got your last name right. I know I got your first name right. <laughs> uh, George, you enter a long list of people that have had challenges with that. So you're you're all good, my brother. I'm I'm very special in that regard. Not really. Yeah. Harrison, did did your parents name you after George Harrison by any chance from the Beatles? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say no, but in in some reality that exists, I'm sure that's true. So let's let's go with it. Let's roll with it. <laughs> For sure. So Harrison, let us know where you at right now in your life. Physically, where I'm at right now in my life, physically and mentally. Oof, good question. So I am physically in Australia. I am on the east coast of of the of the country that is Australia, near uh, Byron Bay. If people are familiar with the geography and mentally it's a really good question because i uh i'm about to at the at the time of this recording i'm heading overseas this weekend and uh i'm going on a bit of a mission to spread more of my medicine and my voice out in the world so mentally i'm feeling all the things but overall i'm very excited to step into this potential Perfect. I'm really, I'm really happy to hear that. And Harrison, if you could tell the audience, what do you do? What so is your occupation? Right now, what is your calling? Yeah, yeah. Nice little, nice little simple question to begin. I uh, right now in this moment in my life, I spend my time supporting souls, supporting individuals that come to see me, or who I work with in ceremonies and workshops, or who I speak to, dropping from their head into their heart, right? And there are many ways that we go about this, but I teach from a very spiritual and emotional perspective on how we can learn to live in a consciousness state of love rather than something we're looking outside of ourselves to attain. Right. And that's why I'm really interested to have you on. You, in fact, came uh, heavily recommended by a recent guest of ours, Leah, Leah Drew. She had a lot of great things to say about you, and the way she talked about you, I just had to have you on, Harrison. Well, Leah is beautiful in her own right, and uh, we have our own story of connection, but I think she's a wonderful example, and hopefully your listeners will be able to feel this when they listen to her. She's uh, someone that really lives from the heart as well, so we connect on that level. Yeah, she was she was definitely a very empathetic and very nice person to talk to. And, you know, I kind of see it a bit in you. I don't know what it is, the the long flowing locks, the beautiful pattern of wallpaper. Or is it just like your really relaxed demeanor? I feel like there's not a lot of you these days where I'm around. Well, how do you want me to answer that question, George? I could answer it from a superficial oh, level of what's happening or a very deep level of what's happening. How do you want me to go about it? Well, I would like the deep level, please. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, you know, George, what you're feeling is you're feeling yourself. And what I mean by that is I spend a lot of my own personal time cultivating a connection into my inner power, right? And people will have different names for that, higher self, God, the divine, the universe, you know, whatever you call it, intuition, I spend most of my time connecting to that. And a symptom of that connection is when I get to spend time with lovely people like yourself. People feel it, right? They feel it and they think it's me. You thought it's me. And on one superficial layer, it is. But on the deepest layer, the power that you feel emitting the peace, the presence, it's you. You feel yourself. So am I basically projecting projecting what's already inside me inside onto you? In one form, it's more like 
I'm constantly projecting my, I'm going to call it frequency of power, of divinity, of godliness. And in that projection that you happen to be in in this moment, the part of your godliness, the part of your divinity, the part of your power, it awakens to it. And then it comes from the inside out. Right. I definitely want to pick your brain more on that. But first, before we get to all that is deep and meaningful, I want to ask you, Harrison, how was, how, what is your background? Like, I want to know what, I want to know how a person's childhood is and the way they grew up, that they come to a place where you appear to be and keeping in mind to the audience that me and Harrison have spoke and discussed before about his viewpoints and things like this. I want to ask, uh, yeah, what happened to you in your past that led to the person we see today, starting with your childhood? So like everyone's past, it's quite a long story and quite a series of fortunate and unfortunate events. But I've spent some time now, and I'm really grateful that I got to do this when I wrote my book that I'm sure we'll talk about at one point in this chat. I was able to pick out the points at this moment in time that I think were the most significant to answer mm -hmm. your question, right? Mm -hmm. So the first part was as a boy, as a little boy growing up, I grew up in a society, in a culture, in a family, in a, in a worldview that projected onto me the belief that as a man, it is weak, it is wrong, it is unmanly to be sensitive, to be vulnerable, to be emotional, to be intuitive. So I spent a big chunk of my childhood, adolescence, younger 20s, suppressing that, suppressing mostly the divine feminine inside of me. Fast forward into my adolescence, trigger warning for people tuning in, I was sexually abused and went through what you could imagine one goes through around all of that happening to a young little man. Fast forward again a few more years, I led a life of externalization of the self. What I mean by that is because of the pain and the stories and the abuse, I was looking for love in the outside world. I was looking to be soothed and supported through women, through drugs, through alcohol, through extreme experiences. And then in my mid-20s, this all sort of ramped up to the point where I had another traumatic event of being deported and jailed in the US, subsequently flying back to Australia and leaving me in the point of, okay, now what? Now what do I do? And I want to ask, when you were engaging, as you said, in the, the, the drugs, the women and other acts, was it because you were trying to distract yourself from pain, internal pain? Were you trying just not to be in your present? So on the superficial layer, yes. On the deeper, the deepest of layers, what I was actually looking for was love. I was looking to feel loved. I was looking to feel worthy. I was looking to feel enough. Yeah. And I'm guessing it didn't, that lifestyle before your deportation, it wasn't getting you there. It was in very short-term gains, right? As anyone that's had these kinds of experiences, you can imagine there's lots of little hits, right? Lots of little yeah. hits of, oh, this feels good. Oh, this feels great. Oh, this, this love is me. This is what I want. But after a while, that becomes numbness, that becomes desensitization. And I wasn't seeing it as that. I wasn't even aware of this happening, but it's what was happening. It's what subs subsequently led to all the pain coming up. Yeah, it's definitely a story I hear again and again, because even me in my university years, and even me now, I look around and I see myself and people of my generation, like things just don't seem so great. And not only do they not seem so great now, they don't seem like they're ever going to get great. So we live in like the, you, do you remember YOLO? No one says it anymore, but you remember YOLO? I do, I do, yes. Yeah, you only live once. 
So now I'm just seeing a bunch of people just like clubbing, clubbing, drinking, drugs, mm. sex, gambling, like cigarettes, mm. junk food. Like, as you mm. said, these are short term dopamine hits, but they really don't mean much and really don't contribute to anything well in the long run. But yeah. you seem to have moved away from that, like you said, after getting the port yeah. from the States. Usually you're the port yeah. from Australia, especially if you're like a plant <laughs> or a bag of fruit from overseas. Other way around. Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, what got you on this journey? Like, what, did you did you see someone's teachings online? Did you watch a TED Talk? Did you uh, yeah. try some ayahuasca? Did you just walk outside and say, this is not working for me? Yeah. So I guess the first thing that got me onto the onto the path was being honest with myself and creating the space to ask the inner questions. Right? You you portrayed that lifestyle that's you know exacerbating. And I can't wait to talk about that more later when we go deeper into that. But one of the components of that exacerbation is the unwillingness that we'll have to actually sit with ourselves and ask the important questions or i would say more specifically feel feel the answers to those questions so the first step was actually doing that right starting meditation starting time for me where i wasn't focusing on anything else except for me then all the things that you mentioned came as a symptom of that right the teachers the plant medicine the the youtube videos the podcast all of it but they came as a symptom of me making the choice to be quiet with myself to ask the important questions and be willing to feel now i have a serious question but i also want to ask what do you mean by plant medicine is this is this another term for the devil's lettuce <laughs> no, or talking about marijuana here <laughs> no 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 i um I categorize plant medicine as all of these, um, like ayahuasca, right? Ayahuasca, marijuana, mm. uh, bufo, uh, St. Pedro, all of these traditional, uh, often psychedelic substances that support people in awakenings. I categorize all peyote. of them as plant medicine. Peyote, yes, another one. Yeah. Even though some of them aren't plants, I just categorize all of them as plant medicine. Yeah. I've always been interested in that world, as is anyone who listens to Joe Rogan. Yeah. But I think it, per, me personally, that part of the experimenting is a little too scary for me. I'm a very paranoid person. Maybe that says a lot yeah. about me. So any any thought of just like letting go scares me because I always want to be in control because I'm scared of losing control. I think a lot of Ooh. people are this way. But the other question I wanted to ask is, to reach this point where you went outside and like kind of had a quiet think of where you were going in your life, did it require such a drastic uh, incident like getting kicked out of country? Like, did it require something yeah. extreme to just like wake you up and like be like, okay, something's not working here? Yeah, it did. Because mm -hmm. I think what we all have to realize is that we live in a universe where not just everything is happening for a reason everything is happening for us and throughout that whole period of time of pain and and unconsciousness that i would classify it as there were messages i would there was messages coming of saying hey little messages of hey this is not what you should be doing hey you need to look within hey you need to stop doing x activity hey you need to feel me all the all the stuff but due to my unconsciousness I wasn't listening. So what often happens, and I refer to this as the pain teacher, all of the messages that want to get our attention, if they can't get our attention subtly and slowly and softly, they will get our attention abruptly, strongly and suddenly. And even in that itself is not something bad that's happening to us. It's happening in that way because it's the only way that we'll listen in the moment. Right. So it's basically a wake-up call from the universe. But what you teach, I'm Which guessing, doesn't require something so extreme. It doesn't require you to have like this. Like with you, thank God. You know, I'm happy to see that it 
gave you such a positive change, but there's a lot of cases where something so extreme happens to someone and they and unlike you, they break. You know, they yeah. they go deeper into the alcoholism, the drug abuse, yeah. they become depressed, they become anxious, they kind of give up on their aspirations. With you, you've yeah. taken it a different route. You've taken what I believe, uh, and you know more about this than me in our discussion. You've taken what Carl Jung would call like a spirit, the spiritual awakening that is required for extreme change. Because mm. he was talking mostly about how people who are alcoholics and addicts, a lot of times when all things fail, when they ignore all those little warning uh, warning signs in life that they need to improve their life and get their shit together it takes something so extreme that could be categorized as a spiritual awakening for them to actually set the record straight and take control and with you would you say that was the case the short answer is yes and i think you just said all of that so beautifully george but i want to just throw something out here on top of that of course there is no wrong or right right it, we, people hearing what you just said could be very easily persuaded to assume that the left path, let's say that Harrison took of the spiritual awakening, is the quote-unquote right path. And the right path of the going further into the unconsciousness, into the addiction, the, you, the example that you gave, is the quote-unquote wrong path. And I want to just place something here, and we'll probably talk about it at the end in terms of this big issue and challenge that we have as a, as a, as a generation. There is no wrong or right, right? There's a, it's a Shakespeare quote, quote, right? There, there is no no wrong or right. The thinking makes it so, right? It is our perception that, let's say that if Harrison went the other direction and dropped into deeper layers of sex addiction, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, that he's bad, that he's wrong. But in reality, I made a choice with my free will. And whatever choice and path we end up walking, we're responsible of. And there's nothing outside of me when I get to the end, and whatever we define as the end, that's marking me wrong or right. It's just a story and a conversation of, do I wish to keep expanding? Do I wish to keep evolving? Do I wish to keep awakening? Or do I want to stay where I am? Right. I think that's a lot of things people really need to look deep inside and kind of figure out because some people are, you've changed from what you were. We can establish that. A lot of people are scared of that change. Hmm. So maybe by watching this video, they could be, I guess we could call it inspired to make a change if something clearly is not working out in their lives. And I know my audience, I know a lot of my followers personally, and I know some people in general Things are not going right with this generation. So that's why we're here talking to you to get your opinion and your views and your philosophies. So I want to ask you, Harrison, regarding your personal philosophies, can I ask for your view on things such as life? Why are we here today? Mm. So we've been dancing around this a little bit already in this discussion. But I think we have a purpose we all have a purpose in this life and i think that purpose is twofold i think one and it's the same for all of us the first most important purpose we'll have is to awaken to what we actually are and what we actually are is a limitless divine spiritual being having a human experience right so that's part one of the purpose meaning of life story we all have to walk our own path to come back to that truth. And that involves the awakening that you've already discussed. But part two of the purpose is answering the question of what will I do with that unlimited power? What will I do with that divinity? What will I do with that unbounded consciousness that is me once I realize that that is what I am? What will I decide to share with the world? What will I decide to step into? What will I decide to create? What will I decide to express from that inner power? And I really believe that that is one of, if not the reason that we're all here. Right. 
And I want to ask, when you say divine, it brings me to think of religion or let's call it the spiritual mm-hmm. realm. Mm-hmm. What do you believe is divine? Because, you know, on the one end, we have the Abrahamic religions, there's God, yeah. and he's all powerful and created everything. Then on the other end, we have Hinduism, Buddhism, there's a cosmic consciousness, yeah. and the purpose of our life is to live such a neutral life that we balance out our karma and it, our dharma or karma, whatever you want to pick. And then we achieve this nirvana state, and then we become part of that cosmic consciousness. These are what the major religions think. I'm here to yeah. know what Harrison thinks. What is yeah. divine? What is out there? Now, I'll put a I'll put a little non shameless plug for my podcast, the Cosmic Love Antenna. I dive deep into all of those sort of belief systems and those ways of viewing your power and your divinity. So if you want a deeper conversation, definitely go check out my 200 plus episodes. But to answer it shortly for you here, George, is let's put all of those belief systems aside. Let's put, there is divinity in all of them, in my opinion. That divinity can be found in every single one of the religious belief systems that exist. But divinity can also be found outside of all of them, in everything. I define divinity as everything that you see in this current, everything that you see and don't see in this current experience that we're all living in. Divinity, another way of describing it, is consciousness, this pure, loving, unconditionally loving consciousness that I am born from, bathed in, and constantly emitting from me. Right. Do you believe in the traditional God? It depends which tradition you are referring to, but let's Fair enough. let let let's say let's use the tradition that I grew up in actually of Christianity, and in that tradition it teaches that God is one a person, two externalized on a cloud outside of you, and three testing you around the decisions that you are making, wrong or right. And if you're asking me if I believe it's that traditional God, I would answer with a with a firm no. True. Fair enough. It's a definitely an interesting way to look at the world. Mm. Was, I feel like many people are coming to terms with a very spiritual point of view. Mm. A lot of people, not so much, more of a theocratic point of view. Mm. So now I want to ask about your views regarding, and this is the word that comes up a lot with you, love. <laughs> what is what is love? What what do you think about love out there? Are we are we deficient in vitamin love? I love that. By the way, might have to make that steal that and make that a t-shirt, George. Are you deficient in it. vitamin love? Um. So, I'll answer the first question first, and then and then talk about the deficiency. What is love? And love is actually what I already just answered in terms of what is God, what is consciousness. To me, love is the same thing that God and consciousness is. It is what we are born from, bathed in, and constantly emitting from our hearts. Love is a consciousness state. It is not merely an emotional feeling or interaction and sensation you have for some someone or something. Love is what you are. Love is what we're in. So love is consciousness, basically. Right. In answering, are we deficient in vitamin love? We cannot be deficient of what we already are. What we can be, however, is stuck in illusion and shadow around that divine truth. Right. We can forget that all the love we ever need is us. We can forget that it's impossible to be unlovable or to have my love taken away. So from that perspective, some of us are very deficient, including myself for a long time. Right. Do you believe in like the whole message, which is it's our duty to love one another, provide love for each other? Because we see that theme a lot. I don't know if we practice it, but we see it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. and I think it is powerful. I believe in it as long as your definition of love also includes taking action and standing up for people, standing up for yourself, right? Because someone on the outside could hear what you just said 
and I see this a lot, and think that love is just the fluffy, right? Love is just the, the sensual, the sensitive, the, the connected beingness, the sitting still and feeling it in my heart. And it's all of those things. And love is also standing strong in what you believe in. Love is also standing up for the little person. Love is also speaking the thing that needs to be said, even when it's uncomfortable and, and quote unquote should not be said. So the point here is love is both polarities and that's where it needs to exist. Right. So you're giving us an explanation of your views and I understand what you're saying, but I think me and the audience would wish to see it more applied to certain topics of what's really going on in the world today. Because I don't know if it's a mystery to you, Harrison. Maybe you've achieved such a very complete uh, state of Zen. But a lot of people in the millennial generation, and it seems to be in the Gen Z generation, we aren't happy. You know, mm -hmm. some people say, oh, you're just being soft, you're just being squishy, you're just being whiny. And to the, that person, I say, shut up, dad. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. My, my dad's very supportive and I love him. It's, it's my mother who's the downer. But like my point is, what do you think is plaguing our society today? Like what's just not working? That's like leading to the increased use of therapy, the increased use of medication, the increased use of these very temporary dopamine hits that we discussed where you just live your whole day. You miss your childhood. Well, some of us who have been fortunate enough to have stable childhoods, we miss our childhood. We fear the future because it looks bleak as fuck. If part of my language, mm. it just looks bleak. That doesn't seem to be a positive place that we're reaching. And it, we want to ignore the current or distract ourselves from our current state that we engage mm. in junk food, alcohol, drugs, mm. sex, mm. pornography, smoking, anything, any gaming, anything that will take us away from where mm. we are now. And I know that was a bit of a spiel, but to simplify, what is plaguing us today? Mm. So I'll first start by saying, George, that what you're describing is a very complex challenge, right? And there are many different facets, facets to it. But if I was to begin to start that conversation, I would start with what I described before as our, fir our first purpose of being, and that is to awaken and remember what we are. Right, as a young boy, as an adolescent that had all, if not most, of the things that you just described as plaguing our generation, my biggest challenge was I was becoming identified by these addictions, by the food, by the porn, by the drugs, by the experience, by the short term wins that I elucidated in my journey. And it's in the identification of the pain the identification of the suffering, we lose ourselves, right? We, we spiral downwards. We spiral into the victim. We spiral into the identity of the shadow, that we're, whatever we're currently in, the wound, the pain. So the biggest solution to all of these challenges, in my opinion, George, is more of a conversation and more of inspired action on how we can all start to not just detach from that pain, not just remember what we actually are, but actually start to self-soothe, start to hold those shadows in a state of love so we can actually expand. And how does that look like from an external point of view? Like, let's say if I was seeing a friend Mm -hmm. Like, let's say someone, maybe Leia, maybe myself, maybe some random stranger, if they were practicing what you taught, how would that look yeah. like in their life? Mm. So the first step will always be cultivating stillness and quietness. The first step will always be, George, in the way that suits you, right? And this is why I talk about with people that I work with, but on an average, it tends to be meditation, right? Creating space for you to get quiet and to start going within. And for most of us, that's going to be a very difficult thing to do, right? It's not meant to be easy. If it was easy, then this challenge that you'd be talking about would be done over with. But 
it's the place to begin. Because until we, until we invert our projection of self from the external to the internal, the conversation can't even begin, let alone reach its conclusion. Does that require, and this is again a recurring theme with certain religions, especially the, I forgot what it's called, ascetic, ascetic does, religions? Yeah, it doesn't require Where you kind of are religious... meant to give up your material? Like, does this mean, I, I know you're shaking your head, but I want to ask the question, even though you, you just yeah, gave me yeah. the answer. Because I'm going to be frank, Harrison, when we see people who look like you, and I'm not talking about the Zen. I'm not talking about the inner peace. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of looking about talking about the long flowing hair, the mandala. The, I know that's not really a mandala, but like the, things like this the in Jesus, the back. The Jesus look, George. The Jesus. Look. The Jesus look, like especially like the pink, the the flower child look. We we think of a hippie, and I, I already know you're not a hippie. Like we've had that conversation. Your stuff's like you read philosophies, you read science, you practice what you preach. It's not about the drugs. Like I know you're not a hippie, but what distinguishes what you preach from a hippie because i don't know if you've mm. watched south park mm. but i don't know mm. do you know cartman i do yes yeah you know carmen do you, do you know what he said about hippies tell me he's like ah oh, hippies they want to change the world but all they do is smoke pot and smell bad <laughs> like what distinguishes your school yeah. of thought from the hippie school yeah. of thought where you know they just have they just feel like they have to give up everything withdraw from society and just form their own con counterculture yeah. yeah well i'll put it very frankly and simply cuz that's how you're meeting me my friend and i love it any person listening to this recording right now no matter your skin color no matter your faith no matter your sex no matter your upbringing no matter your society your culture whatever can close their eyes and create at least 30 seconds of silence in their life, right? That's it. That's, that's the beginning. You don't need any, any other layer on top of that. And I'm not taking anything away from, the, quote, the as you said, the hippies or the spiritual movement or the beliefs, religious belief systems in the world. Like I said, God can be found in all of them. Divine can be found in all of them. But just because it can be found in all of them doesn't mean it's it's the medicine that you need in this moment. And every single person listening to this can close their eyes and start to create stillness in their world. And that's the difference. Right. I'm going to try to practice that, but I guess I'm too stuck in the in the ego, as they say. That's, George, that's what it is right you you said it like jokingly but i want to underline it that's that's the challenge that's the challenge that anyone has with what i just spoke about is being stuck in the ego and i don't say that negatively because the ego is a part of us and deserves to be loved but we need to be able to distinguish what's happening with it and what we actually want to connect to within Right. And I want to ask for you, what is, what is ego? If someone had, cause me, I've talked to many guests, I've some upcoming, some potential, and they talk about, they're, they're always referring to the ego. Some people have described it being stuck in the material realm with material things such as the nice watch, the nice cap. Okay. Let's, let's focus not on me and that nice cars, tons of money, things like this. And other seem to describe it as something like inside you, like the part of you that just wants to be selfish mm. or vain or proud. Yep. To you, what is the ego? Because I feel like once we define that, we get a better view yes. of your views. Yes, we, we do, George. And it's the million dollar question. I uh, also talk about this in depth in my book because it is so important, right? We must we must have definitions for us to even begin the conversation. I define the ego as a thought structure or a, the ego is our individual self expression. It is what makes me the unique expression of the divine that is distinguished from the unique expression of the divine. That is George put very simply. The ego is not good or bad. 
the ego is what helps me embody my uniqueness. The challenge that people have with the ego is most of us are projecting through our uniqueness, our pain, our shadow, the identities that we think we are, the watch, the car, the house, the family, the job, etc. Where we're taking on a thought form within this thought structure and then projecting it through the ego as our unique expression, thinking that that is us. And then, of course, that reflects back to us pain and suffering because it's not the deepest reality, right? We, the reason that the ego takes us into pain and suffering most of the time is because we're not projecting through it what the actual truth is, right? And the truth is we're not our pain, we're not our car, we're not our job, we're not these belief systems. As we've already talked about, we're so much more than that. And once we connect to that, this is actually what we can actually start to refer to the ego as a healthy ego or an integrated ego. We start pro pro projecting through my, our unique expression, our divinity, our power, that feeling that you feel from me, George, when you're around me that I talked about at the start of this chat, that's coming through my ego. Yeah. Do you feel like in... Do you feel we start off as egotistical people and then that's why we're kind of unhappy these days or it's it's not really our fault and we're kind of being hijacked by the egos of very powerful people? Because if, if I ask my friends, if I ask them what do you guys want, it's kind of simple things. They want to start a family. They want to have a house. And then they just want to live a decent life. But then if you see what they're trying to do, they're trying to get the fast cars. They're trying to get the mansions. They're trying to be like, I don't know if you know, Dan Bilzerian. They are trying to be like, uh, what's his name? Not Elon Musk, the other guy, Jeff Bezos. Yeah. But the thing is, I honestly feel like if we didn't have any social media, no one would be, or, or magazines like Vogue or whatever, no one would be yearning for these things. Yeah, And Vogue and the social media and those magazines and, uh, the internet these are we're looking at we're looking at the egos of other people bigger than us and they're and kind of encapsulating them. us in their desires in their greed yes. i want to say yes so we're being kind yes. of caught up in all of that so such such a beautiful question george and a, a very important one so i'm gonna say it's the answer is yes to both Meaning that, yes, we are being programmed and projected onto by all these external factors. And I would actually say it's far more than just these individuals in the business world or the fashion world or the movie world. There's so many other factors from schooling to, you know, the, the, the health food, the healthcare systems, the food systems. There's so many big players in the world that project onto little children that lead to a very programmed individual who's now an adult. So yes, I think that's very real. However, and this is a big however and a big asterisk, George, we are still responsible. We, despite how programmed we are, at the end of the day, are responsible for either holding on to those beliefs, holding on to those identities, holding on to those thought forms, or doing the beautiful work that's needed to release them, right? This is what many of us would describe as taking the, the shift or the transformation from unconsciousness to consciousness, right? Becoming conscious of all of these belief, egotistical programs that we've indoctrinated, been indoctrinated by, seeing them, becoming aware of them, and taking our power back by making the choice to let them go. It's it's hard, man. It's hard because even for me personally, it's hard to let go. I grew up in Dubai. I grew up in a concrete jungle called Montreal, a rusty concrete jungle. And I feel like to let go of my ego would be to give up my ambition, to be give up my dreams of having a wife and kids mm -hmm. in a house. Because unfortunately, mm -hmm. 
comparison. Whereas in the past, I felt like these were the daily staples of life, having a partner, having children, having a house. It didn't have to be a massive house. We're in a day where it's become ambitious. It's become very hard. Mm. And then what do they tell us to do to get these things? Mm. You have to be an egotistical workaholic focusing on mm. the materialism. Mm. So when you, when you teach people, Harrison, when you have, uh, I don't know what you call them, your clients, your followers, yep. your, yep. your patients, I, I'm not sure. What's, what's the yep. word? For clients, uh, people I work with, what, they're all the same. Yeah, the, the people you the people work that with. that come to see me. Let's just say clients. Yeah. yeah, the people you work with, do they, do they have that same hesitation to let go? Are you teaching them to let go of all of this or to incorporate something into all of this? So, another beautiful question, George. Flattered. It's not about. So, like you spoke earlier about, there's a, there's a lot of uh, Eastern religious systems that that have this perspective of we must we must fully lean into detachment and bypassing the physical world and ignoring all of these of the three D stuff, the ambition, the family, the, the things. And that's not, in my opinion, what needs to be done. Remember what I said earlier about the two stages of awakening to your purpose. The first stage is coming back to the truth, right? And the truth is that you are infinitely loved, you are infinitely worthy, you are infinitely enough, and you have infinite potential to create whatever you want, right, as the divine being that you are. But then the second stage is then going out into the world to share that unique expression of love that you are that unique expression of power that you are and create what you desire right and that desire could be family could be a business could be helping people whatever it is the question though is how how much are we becoming identified by the 3d world along that journey right because that's what's going to cause suffering that's when it, what causes pain because each time we lose something that the ego deems as important, it feels like death. So let's use an example, George. Let's say part of my ambition, as you said, was to grow a business and to build it to a certain level and earn all this money. The moment that all of that goes away and you haven't been mindful around where your identity is based, the moment that that goes away, it's going to feel like death. It's going to feel like suffering. It's going to feel like the deepest of pains because to the ego, it is that. So it's not a question of one or the other, George. It's a question of end, right? Can I be connected to the divine truth while and pursuing my ambitions and doing all the things that I uniquely want to do? Can you? Yes. <laughs> Very no, much. I appreciate, so. I appreciate it. I appreciate the way you phrase that. Because it makes it, like I said, like it, you know, you, you make it sound intuitive because it is, you know, you're kind of, people look at you and they'll say, oh, he's, he's going to sell me some complex mystical stuff. And it's like, no, he's just saying the truth. We're the ones kind of sold on the complex materialist stuff. Exactly. So that exactly. so that when you tell us things like this, like we kind of have to focus on like what's real and ignore like what the ego is pushing for, it does seem as such a shock to our system. That's how much bullshit we filled in our lives, and I think it's yeah, leading to a lot George, of. I just say this before you get to the next point because I want to yeah. pull this out. Go for it. It's because, and you said this, you said this, and I caught it in your words. It's because most of us also hold the belief that it needs to be hard, right? that it should be hard, right? If I'm not suffering, if I'm not sacrificing myself, if I haven't done the hours, if I haven't done the work, if I haven't done the minutes, if I haven't done X amount of effort, then I can't have the thing. I can't have the love. I can't have the worthiness. I can't have all the value. I, I got to say, I completely fucking agree with that. Cause, and not, not with what people are saying, but with what you're saying about what people are saying. Cause Every day, I, I love my parents in an insane amount. My sisters, eh, who cares? But my parents, I love them. I love them, but I don't like them. I love my parents. 
but like what their their messages don't seem to res resonate with me because they're saying you should suffer in life and it's like no isn't the point of mm -hmm. life or society that we reach a point where no one's really suffering like isn't that mm -hmm. the point like to make suffering mm -hmm. a part of life seems very mm -hmm. inefficient and going in the wrong direction and they always mm -hmm. say when you work you need to suffer to be successful but i think mm -hmm. we're confusing suffering with struggling and perseverance like you yes. know work needs to be yes. a struggle i need to problem solve i need to work hard and work smart and figure things out but like to suffer yes to take the shit from your manager to like yes. be in a state of constant anxiety because i don't know if i can afford rent this is really what yes. life's supposed to be about i don't agree with yeah. that but to get back to what i was yeah. saying uh, i wanted to say so I, i believe like all this focus on the materialistic and the ego is leading us to a lot of Some people will call them spiritual problems. Some people will call them mental problems, mental illness, mental uh, disorders, like, as I said already, anxiety, depression. Some people have PTSD, not from like the general stuff. There's some very like extreme stuff that happens that leads people to have PTSD. I want to ask you, all this spiritual suffering, is it doing more than the mental? Like, are we having like physical issues? Because I don't know if you read the statistics and I'm not so much focused on this section of it, but I want to ask, like, have, we're seeing a lot of issues in terms of disease, autoimmune, cancers, mm. just a lot of stuff that in huge amounts we've never seen before. Yeah. Just hitting all the beautiful questions, George, and love, and love your, your heart here in this moment. So I'm going to say two things to clarify and then go deeper one i think everything is a spiritual challenge everything is a spiritual problem and i'll explain what i mean by that and two i this is a bit of context just so people know where i'm coming from here before i was this form that i'm in now and spending most of my time in the spiritual world i you know, started as a personal trainer became a nutritionist started doing therapy from a cognitive mental perspective psychology and then ended up sort of where I am now. So I don't speak this as a hypothetical. I speak this as someone who's had this experience and has seen this play out, not just in his life, but in people that I've worked with. So when I say everything is a spiritual problem and has a spiritual root, the emotional, mental, and physical realm is just a different density what our spiritual form is right i explain when i explain this to people that are new to this world we are a babushka doll do you know what a babushka doll is george a so it's one of those doll? yeah you probably had them growing the up russian dolls? maybe like the russian dolls yeah with yeah. the with the the little one in the middle and then it had a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one okay that is what we are Right, we have all of these layers. The physical human that you see right now, if you're watching this video or listening to me, this is just one density of what I actually am. Right, I am much, 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 much bigger in all the ways than just the physical. And we have these different layers. So, to answer your question, George, when we're talking about autoimmunity, when we're talking about mental challenges, when we're talking about emotional challenges, I will say with 100% certainty, based off my experience and perspective, that each of them will have a spiritual root. Well, each of them will have at least a spiritual component that if you looked at and spent time with, it would drastically shift that physical, mental, emotional pain that you're moving through. Right. So... With how we are, would you feel like it's pretty accurate to say we're spiritually deficient, spiritually stunted, spiritually blocked? And I guess I would call myself spiritually constipated. To put that beautiful image I don't know in your mind. I don't know if I would use that word particularly, but it's <laughs> definitely in my mind now, George. So thank you for that. I would say I would say we're we're asleep to what we are. Right? That spiritual us is in us already it's already there 
this is not something we gain. This is not something we go to a doctor to get prescribed. This is something we already are. So the word I would use is we are, we are asleep to what we are. We are, we are unconscious to what we are. Sedated. Sedated. Programmed. Yeah. For sure. And I think it's sad. I think it's sad because, uh, and like I just had a conversation today with a very, a very sweet young girl. She's going to be a future guest. You guys will see her in time. And just the way she talked about her life growing up, just the way you've, you've mentioned about what's happened in your life growing up, even Leia, even other guests I've had on and even the people I see around me. It's sad. It's sad because people call us, call us the spoiled generation, you know, the weak, squishy, soft, whiny, lazy generation. And to be fair, there is a truth in that, in the sense that life before was harder in certain ways. Because I feel like our parents and their parents, especially like um, more traditional societies, they were on survival mode. But I put, and, that, and we are no longer in survival mode, but we're still suffering. We have a TV, sure. We have a PlayStation, sure. I have, I have my KFC, sure, sure. You know, stuff my parents didn't have in their time. But this is not, for me, this, this is not the indication of a fulfilling life. Because if we're going to describe it in plant metaphors, and I believe we discussed, I, I believe I used this metaphor with you in our discussion. Our parents were a plant in the wilderness. You know, at any time, a mammal could have eaten them. At any time, a flood could have killed them. At any time, there could have been a drought. At any time, a freaking buffalo could have stepped on them. But the soil was rich. The air was clean. The sun was bright. And if they survived, they thrived. Us, we're, we're a freaking fern. I don't know what you're going to call it. A fern, a little plant in like a kitchen under a lamp. You know, we're alive. But what a miserable existence, you know? We're not vivid. We're not... Mm -hmm dealing well we just got like some tap water sometimes it's mm -hmm. it's we've got what we need to have the bare minimum but we don't have what we need to thrive and when i'm talking mm -hmm. with you it seems to me like a lot of us what we need to thrive is something that would be beneficial for our spirit we need our spirit to thrive not just the basic necessities yeah and just to make this very clear george if the spirit thrives everything else will because Spirit is everything else, right? Yeah. As within, so without, right? If we connect to the spirit, the soul, that infinite power that is us, it impacts everything, right? So your example of what you just gave with the comparisons, from your world perspective, I'm, every, I'm sure every point of that is accurate. However, what is also accurate is that same eternal soul that was in your parents that was in that different generation also exists inside of you. And both versions have infinite capacity. So yeah. when we, I think, and I, sit, I share this because just like we can fall under individual victimhood as an individual, like thinking that the world is against us, right? That I am the victim of my individual circumstances. I think we can also fall into that same archetype as a collective, right? This generation, has it this way, has it that way, doesn't have this, doesn't have that. And because of that, this generation, everything's against us. And that's an illusion, right? Because that's the inverse of where the power lives. The power will never be external. The power will always be internal, whether it's a collective or an individual. Yeah. So then as, unfortunately, I know you're, I know we have a strict schedule to keep to make sure you don't miss anything important. Harrison, on the on this beautiful note, because I really enjoyed what you said. In fact, actually, I think half of it is what you said, and half of it is like you're just calming presence. Funny, you know, that. I'm not I'm not in such Funny a rush to ramble. Yeah. I want to ask you, knowing our society, knowing the millennials out there who feel lonely and inadequate, and the Gen Z who might reach that stage themselves as well. One message do you have to them? Ooh. So my message is, George, that it only, it only takes one step. And 
I'm going to explain it with a quote, one of my favorite of all time by Rumi. And Rumi says, the way appears once we start to walk it. And what I refer to here is, you know, that picture that you just painted for all the individuals and the collective that we're a part of. It is very bleak. And one of the reasons it is bleak is because us as individuals think we have to do all the things all at once, right? Often because of the programming we talked about earlier and the working hard, the suffering, the sacrificing. But I'm here to remind everyone that it will only ever need one step, right? So if that one step is reaching out to someone, if that one step is 30 seconds of meditation, if that one step is closing your eyes for a second and just breathing, if that one step is going outside to connect to nature, if that one step is deciding to open your heart instead of act from your mind, it only takes one step. And if you keep repeating that progress, one step turns into a life shift and it begins with making that initial choice. Yeah. It's definitely a choice I think people should consider. But Harrison, uh, thank you for your time. People should know that you're not going to, you're not going to only be available in this specific video. You have social media and uh, materials of your own. Could you tell us a bit more about where to find you? Well, I want to send you some love first, George, for welcoming me onto your beautiful show. I know Leah connected us, but you still needed to make the choice to host me and speak to me and ask me all the beautiful questions. So I want to really honor you, George, in your heart. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we've met at this point in our lives, you know, other than the podcast, of course. So I just honor you as the soul that you are and the journey that you're taking right now. I appreciate it. So for people that want to connect to me deeper, you can find me on all social media platforms. I think my username is on the screen, but for those who can't see it, it's at Harrison Ma, Ma spelled M-E-A-G-H-E-R. You can also find out more about me on my website and connecting for coaching and sessions, harrisonma.org, as well as... We know we speak about we spoke about a lot of topics today, and George and his beautiful questions hit on a lot of spiritual, religious, mystical foundations. If you want to go to deep, go deeper into all those. I recommend you check out my podcast, Your Cosmic Love Antenna, available on all beautiful players. And then finally, if you want some practical tools to start connecting into this state of love and sharing your gifts with the world, it's on the screen right now. You can also go to cosmicloveantenna.org and you can pick up my book that I have on everything that we've talked about and more today. Perfect. Guys, all these links will be down below. Please check out Harrison's work, check out his social media and definitely check out his book. Harrison, thank you, John. Once again, a thank you to you for coming on this show and sharing with us your uh, philosophies and wisdom. I want to say, because you have been through a lot in life and we don't need, to, and you know, we hope that these things we experience don't happen onto others, though we still wish to teach them the same lessons. So it doesn't happen once again, guys, if mm -hmm. you haven't already done so, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, share our social media, because doing us, doing all this helps us grow. The more we grow, the more amazing guests we can bring on like Harrison and his very calming personality. Thanks for your time, Thank Harrison. You, Everyone else, have a great day.